Yeah. No, so it's so fascinating. There's too much to know. That's the reason I, I trip up and hesitate about saying like factual stuff about it because there's so much out there. You know, it's interesting. Pro, you know, in some places we're still suffering from prohibition, right? I and mean, that interruption of what was handed down and what was happening at the time, you know, we're still trying to, and the fact that the craft distilling movement has just taken off in the last 10 years. There's just so much more interest. And so there's still, I think the thing that surprises me the most and there's still many, so many stones to be turned over, you know, with the history of distillation in the well, United I, States. I tell you what, if you slipped up on here, one of our listeners will. Oh, awesome. I, I, I look forward to it. I like, I like the conversation. They like, they like to call us out quite often and say, Hey, I think you guys yeah. Yeah, slipped, we, slipped up here. We, we don't get away with anything. <laughs> And you know, our that's you know, good. That's good. That means that people are actually listening. To- I'm going to fix it all here in a couple of weeks when we have Michael Veach on now. Oh, yeah. Michael <laughs> fixes everything. Gonna, yeah. Nobody's going to call him out. I don't, I don't <laughs> no. think. Um, and he knows what he's talking about. We're just two guys drinking bourbon, two veterans, you know, just having fun. And- Welcome to another trip down the bourbon road with your hosts, Jim and Mike. So grab a glass of your favorite bourbon and kick back. We would like to thank Tommy and Gwen Mitchell from Loggerheads Home Center for supporting this episode of The Bourbon Road. Find out more about their fine rustic furniture at logheadshomecenter.com. Today we're at the Oscar Getz Museum of Whiskey History in Bardstown, Kentucky. We thought that this would be the perfect place to sit down with Lisa Wicker of the Widow Jane Distillery. Lisa's the head distiller and blender for Widow Jane, and she's brought a couple of their bourbon expressions for us to try today. And you can imagine how excited Mike and I were to find out that one of the bottles she's bringing is the Vaults. It's a 14-year-old bourbon that just released, and with only 500 cases in existence, you know, we're feeling a bit lucky today. And we'll get on to the interview in a minute, but first I'd like to thank Linda and the team at the Oscar Getz Museum for hosting us today. If you haven't had a chance to visit the museum yet, You really need to put it on the list of things to do when you're in Bardstown. The Getz Museum has on display a 50-year collection of rare artifacts and documents all related to the American whiskey industry, dating all the way back from pre-colonial days up until post-prohibition years. Now, the museum includes exhibits on George Washington, Abraham Lincoln. They've got authentic moonshine stills, antique bottles and jugs. They've got advertising art and so much more. I'm telling you, there are dusty bourbon bottles everywhere. And if you're a big history buff who likes bourbon, then this place is a great time. And on December 14th from 2 to 8, they'll be participating in Bardstown's annual Christmas Tour of Homes. The museum will be dressed up for the holidays with Christmas trees and festive decorations. So be sure to stop by and enjoy some homemade refreshments. And the gift shop will be open while you're there. Now, without any more delay, let's get on to our interview with Lisa. Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Shannon. And I'm Mike Hyatt. And this is The Bourbon Road. And today, Mike, where are we? We're in the Oscar Getz Museum of Whiskey History. This beautiful old building here, um, yeah. just filled with all all kinds of bottles of bourbon and whiskey. And you'd be amazed. And the staff here has just been wonderful. And they're going to let us record here today. It's awesome. And who, are, who are we here with? Well, we've got Lisa Wicker with Widow Jane. Lisa, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm so excited. This um, this room brings back some memories. Steve Bean walked, walked me in here the first time I was ever in here to show me some of his family history. And um, it's certainly a pinch me moment right now to be sitting here with you talking into the, the, at Oscar Getz. And <laughs> at, they have a dress up for the holidays, too, don't it's they? It's gorgeous. Yeah. yeah, it's beautiful. Well, we usually like to get straight to the first pour, the fir- first whiskey. Awesome. So what do you have for us today? Uh, our flagship 10-year-old. Um, background on this, um, one of the reasons I was hired. I was originally hired with Widow Jane as a consultant, um, and one of the first projects I was tasked with was taking the um, single barrel, 10-year-old, single source, um, and moving it to um, a multiple source. So it's Indiana, Tennessee, and Kentucky juice. Um, They allowed me to pick how many barrels I wanted to blend, and so I picked five after lots of bench trials. It seemed to be the one that was most, uh, not necessarily consistent, but um, the easiest to handle. Also, you're not matching up barrel for barrel from the different sources. Their goal with that was that we didn't have to drop the 10-year age statement. Right. 
that was really important to my bosses and to the company. And, um, that's what I was tasked with. So keep that. So, um, it varies a little bit, just like any kind of single barrel, small batch. Um, I have a lot of freedom with it. I always looking for some particular widow Jane notes, what we're known for dark stone fruits, baking spice after outside of that, anything goes. All right. Well, let's try it and, uh, see, see how close we come to it. Cheers. (laughs) Cheers. Cheers. I blended all day in New York yesterday. Yeah. So all of a sudden I'm looking for a spit jar. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh no, I can swallow this. That's good. Yeah, right. you can. <laughs> now speaking of that, you're you're for Barstown girl, right? I am. I'm a Bardstown transplant, but um my soul was already here somehow when I showed up here. It's like, oh my gosh, I feel like I've lived here forever. I've been here um nine nine years now. Um I was Moved here from Southern Indiana when my youngest daughter graduated from high school. I was a commercial winemaker before I was a distiller. And where was that at? That was at Brown County, Indiana. Oh, um, yeah, the big wine country right there, yeah. right? <laughs> Yeah, actually, um, yeah, I'd known my boss for years, and there's a whole backstory that um on that and how I ended up working there. And I spent eight years there learning, you know, on training to make wine. And like I said, when my youngest daughter um you know, it was time for her to graduate. I, um, one of the grape growers that we'd been purchasing grapes from was from the Marin County, Kentucky. And their family came up and they said, next year, you can't buy grapes from us because we're going to start our own winery. And my boss offhandedly said, you need to hire Lisa. So I started with them as a consultant. And when she realized I was willing to move, um, they said, you know, can you come on as our winemaker? I said, I, without doing anything, I just said yes in her kitchen at her kitchen table. Wow, there you go. <laughs> That's some of the great things like that'll happen, right? Yes, and that was in Calvary, Kentucky. Um, and so we, you know, had to set up shop quickly and um, had a makeshift. We retrofitted a barn, um, trying to scramble and find some space, and and things came on really fast. Um, we, you know, meantime built a winery. Um, I came to part of the re- decision to come to Kentucky is I'd gotten the bug to distill the man that trained me to make wine. We also, you know, I picked up a lot of whiskey drinking from him. So. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yes. And he would talk about distillation you know, and, and it certainly gave me the bug too. And, um, so I'm thinking, good, if I go to Kentucky and build this winery, I can, you know, get a still and make some brandy. And so I wiggled my way on the legislative committee when I first got here and, um, needless to say, met Steve Beam during the same time. And he used to joke that I had a, a license, no building, and he had a building and no license. He was still waiting on his DSP. So we were each other's extra set of hands. I started going down there once he did get his DSP in the evenings, um, you know, helping with fermentation and, um, cause that's always been my strong suit. And, um, we started poking around with blending, which I found out to be very different than blending wine. Um, and, you know, so that was part of my early education. Well, I'll tell you what, I'd like to take a minute here with this 10 year and talk a little bit about, you know, what we're getting on it. Um, I think I'm impressed that it's got such a, it's got, it's got a big nose, but it's a very typical mm-hmm. kind of a caramel vanilla. Um, Some of the juice I inherited with this project, um, was so substantial. And then some of the, the juice that we've had to purchase, not had to, but that we've cho- chosen to purchase um, for this project, um, it didn't drink as bold as the age statement on it. And so that we moved the barrels and okay. moved them to Rick houses that were more, um, looked like they had more promise and they have delivered. Okay. So this it's been a really interesting progression from, like I said, you know, whiskey that wasn't drinking as old as its age statement to some that's now seeming like it's exceeding its age statement. <laughs> so this is a blend of three different states, states, uh, the, the youngest of which is 10 years. Correct. Okay. So Indiana, Kentucky and Tennessee, Tennessee. Got it. I get, I get some floral notes on this. Yeah. I, I think it's uh, quite beautiful. You still get that, that spice on the back end. I'd, I'd like to say I could almost pick one or two out of where it's from, but I'm not going to try. That, that would be disrespectful at no, this point. No, please go. Please this go. Is, uh, I was curious. 91 proof. You know, it, it, I think it drinks like a 100 proof almost to, to me. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a big whiskey. It's bold and it's what we're looking for, actually. It's I'd call very this, Widow Jane. I'd call this my Merle Haggard. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> so we Jim blended a whiskey uh, himself and... And we were talking about, and I said, uh, 
you know, we, I think we drank one whiskey and I said, well, that's, that's kind of a Johnny, his blend was a Johnny cash, kick your stage lights out. Cause it had that punch <laughs> in the back of the mouth and stuff. And, Love and it. Uh, I just, you know, it's sometimes fun to say, Hey, this is a Merle Haggard. I know? like that. Give it a, per- yeah, give it a, uh, everyone always says whiskey has a personality, but like, give it a personality. Give it a, per- I think that's give awesome. a person, right? <laughs> give oh, yeah. it a person yeah. and it's personality. No, absolutely. And to me, uh, bourbon and whiskey kind of go with country music and uh, oh absolutely absolutely the um um i randomly picked this bottle at the batch um when whiskey advocate asked for the sample and um actually because i'm in new york it was able to hand deliver it you know to the offices only they don't let you see anyone you have to go up through the like the the back elevator and through the mail room and that sort of thing. So they can keep, you know, they don't have a person associated necessarily with the sample. Um, the, so this one, we, we scored a 90 with whiskey advocate. I was very pleased with that for randomly picking the bottle off of the retail shelf and taking right. it without like trying to curate it or, you know, make sure that was what, what I considered you know, the best of the best. And so it was nice for me just to be able to pick something blind and take it to them and still have a substantial well, score. Congratulations. That's a, that's Thanks. a great score. That really Thanks. is good. Yeah. Oh, I haven't tasted yet. You've been nosing the whole time. I've been I'm, nosing the whole time. You've been drinking it, Mike. You know me. I'm always <laughs> over here drinking it. <laughs> yeah. Trying to play John Wayne over here. <laughs> oh, that is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So now I've tasted it. It is full flavored. It is a um, little nutty. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we go through the pecan kind of spectrum yeah, sometimes. Yeah, pecan. Sometimes we pick up some old leather. Sometimes it's pecan. Yeah, we've got all kinds of things going on with it. Like I said, the baking spice is, you know, yeah. ultimately what I'm always looking for in every blend. Um, now, I, you know, I always I always say baking spice because I think about that flavor I'm getting. Is it more of a nutmeg mm-hmm. or an allspice or a cinnamon? or This is more of a nutmeg, I think. I'd, I'd agree with that. That's Yeah. I That's think so, spot on but I'm stuff. getting a little bit of uh, something. The rye in here is contributing a little mm-hmm. bit of citrus, not 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 a lot, but just a, a hint of it. That is common. Yeah, Fre- frequently lemon, sometimes bitter orange, um, sometimes just orange peel. People come up with the. Um, I also encourage everybody to taste all of those things. You know, it's like okay, we think we all know what nut, nut, nutmeg tastes like, right? Because we've had it sprinkled on our eggnog or whatever. But sure. um, I encourage people to like to actually go to your spice cabinet and taste the stuff raw, because without sugar in it, you'll get some um, crazy, um, more of a bark kind of wood kind of note to some of those spices. Sure. You know, because that, you know cinnamon's bark, right? Uh, nutmegs and little, you know, little round nut thing, you know. And so, um, but without sugar, it is a completely different, um, um, gosh, I'm like struggling for the word, like spectrum of taste, I guess, for lack of a better phrase, right. um, than you do when, with everything sweetened. Yeah, I mean, same, same with cocoa powder, right? Absolutely. I mean, it's just total, totally different. Absolutely. Yeah, a little sugar to it. You got chocolate. Right. And so those. some of those flavors change so dramatically with sugar added to them and, right. you know, they might be a little bit more b- bitter or pungent or whatever. And, um, but I encourage everybody to taste all that stuff raw. So what is the batch size of uh, of the Widow Jane 10 year? Five barrels. Five um, barrels. We went through a big spectrum of, you know, whether we're going to do two. Well, we couldn't do two because we got three states, three, five, seven, as many as 20. Um, and at bench trial after bench trial, five was easier for me to control. Um, and anyway, we were able to come up with it's, it works for our production area size. We are two buildings. We've got the distillery building and which also houses the retail space, but then literally across our cobblestone street, we have our warehouse and that's where we receive all of our barrels, you know, that are obviously stored off of site. Everything that we store on site, we are producing on site there, but we're space is a little bit of a limit. And so even the five barrels, you know, as you're looking at a product, you're looking at even the production um, space that it's going to take and, and your manpower and can one guy dump all these barrels, right. And get them blended. And, um, you know, can we, how many can we of those, can we move through a week? And so this lent itself, this one was, this was the, um, most successful. So do you feel like the, I, I realize that you've chosen five barrels out of a sort of a logistical kind of thing, mm-hmm. right? But do you feel that the larger a batch size get, the easier it becomes? No, absolutely not. We'll talk about that with the vaults. The vaults was 20 barrels, 21 barrels. And no, it doesn't get any easier, um, especially, you know, when you're a control freak. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and you're trying to put these things together. So, you know, because what what's happening is you're, you're, when you're, 
blending, especially with all of these barrels, all the barrels, you're not absolutely sure what they're going to yield. So you're sitting at your desk and you can always make a beautiful blend. But do we know how many gallons are in this barrel and this barrel? And how is that proportion going to happen when we combine them? We can't just dump them together. So I have the most amazing warehouse manager. He, we're very fortunate. He's got an amazing palate. I can trust him to, you know, and he also can tell me and he'll write on my samples, you know, he'll say this barrel's a little bit lower. And I know what lower means now, right? Especially with the different States, you know, a lower from Indiana might not equal a lower from Tennessee. Sure. So I, you know, we know now if that, that barrels, I know on average is going to, um, yield, you know, 27, 29 gallons, or this other state's going to yield about 34. And so I'm able to break the proportions down. And then um, he goes ahead and blends them and brings me back a 200 milliliter sample. So I do taste it after it's been blended and proved to be sure that we're, on, you know, we're spot on. Um, it's good to have somebody like that, isn't it? It's wonderful. I have amazing staff. My staff, <laughs> I, my staff is phenomenal. I inherited most of them. We, the people that we've hired since I've been there, um, we are, you know, the other day I, it was so nice. I had a call um, with a project that we're working on and, you know, everybody was working, but everybody, there was so much laughter and we've got a couple of distillery dogs and they're barking and people are laughing, but we're getting work done. Right. And so it's such a wonderful, um, you know, family, widow Jane family. So do the distillery dogs chase the distillery cats? We don't have a distillery cat. Oh, you don't? <laughs> no, <laughs> we did for a while when I first got there and um, everybody felt so bad for the cat because she was so lonely in the warehouse and everything. And so we found her another home. So oh. yes. And so we have dogs now. We also have some chickens. We have chickens. We have a courtyard. So, you know, you look at my, my, uh, from my, where my desk is and where my blending table is. And I look out over a courtyard with a tree oh. in it and chickens. So, you know, it's like, is it Kentucky or is it New York? Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's, let's get into the history of widow Jane. Mm -hmm. Um, so Tell us, tell us how Widow Jane started and the, the history of it. Uh, Widow Jane, we just celebrated our seventh anniversary. Um, it was founded by a man that originally had been um, in the chocolate business, um, and they were manufacturing chocolate in the building, and he decided to get into um distillation and founded the company, um, you know, founded the founded, you know, I tell people when you start a craft distillery, there's two ways for cash flow. You either make white spirits and do it and, you know, release those, or you source whiskey because putting down barrels is a reverse pyramid scheme. All your money just keeps building out the door rather than, you know, until you start to release it and turn, turn the tide the other way. But, um, so anyway, he had source whiskey, um, and they had excellent source whiskey. They, you know, came out of the, out of the gate strong. Um, he was a colorful character. Um, and you know, there's, there's lots of stories there. So Samson and Surrey bought them three years ago. So they're seven years old. Samson and Surrey is, um, the parent group they own, um, in our portfolio, we have few spirits in Evanston, few bourbon and few rye. Um, we have Philadelphia blue coat gin, um, we have, which is Philadelphia distilling. We have Bren French malt to Allison park and her, her product. And it's fabulous stuff. Right. And we have a mezcal plant and in Oaxaca, Mexico for me mezcal Vago, but it's a beautiful family to be in. And, um, I'm tasked with some really crazy interesting things. And, you know, I like to be pushed and I get pushed hard and treated very kindly. So do you guys have, do you personally have a lot of interaction with the other business divisions of this company? We do, but they, they're committed to keeping us independent of one another, you know? So, um, we all have our own identities. We all have our own way of operating our businesses. Um, what it does provide for us is a unified sales team, mm -hmm. unified advocacy. Um, you know, a little bit of the, um, you know, some, some, it's helpful, you know, on some of our raw materials and that sorts of things too. So are you able to pick up the phone and call one of the other oh, head distillers and say, Hey, I, I'm seeing this over here. Have you ever seen anything like oh, this? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And that part's great because it's still in the family, right? You know, so you're not hanging out your dirty laundry, <laughs> somebody else <laughs> to see, or your positive things, you know, get so fired up about something that you're doing and it's not time for the general public to know. And we've got other people, you know, in the, um, and there's just that general camaraderie as well, you know, but it, no, it's no, we absolutely Paul help go from, you know, if you pick up the phone sometimes or send me a text message, you know, out of the blue about something and no, it's, it's lovely. And Steven, their head distiller, the same thing, or, you know, the, the Philadelphia team. Um, I had to be down there recently for, um, some, what was I down there for this last time? I can't remember, but you know, one of, one of the guys there, I barely walked through the door. I haven't seen him in a few months and he 
kid just catches me out of the corner of his eye and he picks up a glass and he goes, hey, taste this. <laughs> Like I had never, you know, never been away from there. So it's, um, yeah, it's nice. It's nice not to be the Lone Ranger, you know, it's that, that part's really helpful. But. Sure. So with that distillery being right there in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. uh, where do you source your water from when you're producing stuff? Um, we use domestic water for mashing. Um, New York's known for its water. Um, that's the reason the bagels and the pizza crust are sought after yeah. because the, actually the, oddly enough, the New York municipal water is really highly rated. Of course, the first thing I do when I start on a project is have all the water tested. So, um, you know, it came back beautifully. Um, uh, we do of course, you know, run it through some carbon, carbon filtration, but it's beautiful water. Our water for our proofing, we, the barrels that we produce in New York and the liquid that we blend, we proof it down with water from Rosendale Mines in Rosendale, New York. Um, that's where the Widow J name came from. There was some controversy about that um, with the previous ownership, but Widow Jane is some of the local folklore in Rosendale. There's different stories about Jane and and the widow and um, Mr. Snyder that owned the mines originally. And everybody's got their own version, but Widow Jane was certainly a presence in Rosendale. We source our water from the Rosendale mines. The mines were mined for um, lime that was then heated. You'll see these ovens that were carved out of the side of the hillsides there, and they heated that, and it was clinker, and the clinker was a hardening agent. There's some, probably some construction people rolling over right now going, oh my God, she's got all that. No, I think, um, you, I think you got it pretty good. Okay, and so this clinker is a hardening agent before Portland cement, right? So they put it in... Um, but that clinker in that cement is holding together, you know, this, the Statue of Liberty, the White House, um, the Brooklyn Bridge, Grand Central Station. And that water is delicious. It is so good. I actually broke down the mineral recipe on it and it is so beautiful. It's, it's, um, th think of the best what mineral water you've ever had. That's really that crispness to it. Um, that minerality to it. Um, not unlike, um, crisp white wine that's got a lot of minerality to it. You know, it's that same sort of flavor profile on it. So the, the primary role of this is, a, is as a proofing water. Yeah. And that's what, you know, so that's something that brings when you're making, doing a blended whiskey or when, even when they were doing a single barrel that certainly sets us apart because that minerality brings so much to cutting it. It is a production problem, um, but we have, you know, mastered how to keep it. We don't chill filter, but we've mastered how to keep it polished now um, without, without the um, mineral water causing some havoc. Um, right. I can imagine, bottle. yeah, <laughs> yes. but you know, it, it brings so much to the table, right? I mean, it brings yes. so much to the table. Oh, it's worth the effort. Some days it doesn't feel like it, but you know, it's like, oh gosh, if we were just cutting this with our own water or something, my life would be easier. But ultimately that's where you get the trade off, right? The work produces something that's, that's beautiful and different. You have distillation operations going on in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. You've got some custom distillation taking place in Kentucky. Yes. You're also sourcing barrels. So you got a lot going on. We got a lot going on. You got a lot going on. <laughs> But yeah. I, I mean, I guess in the second half, we're probably going to get to talking about kind of where does all that lead, you know, yes. the future yes. of Widow Jane. But specifically mm -hmm. about the heirloom corn, mm -hmm. you have a an expression that you make called Baby Jane. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? We don't have a sample today, but I'd like to know no, a little I bit about I'm it. I'm sorry I didn't bring that. Yeah, the Baby Jane is just the bourbon made with Baby Jane. And this is 100% you, right? Mm -hmm. In-house. Mm-hmm. And with the barrels that we're laying down in Kentucky as well, because that you know we, everybody's like, is that going to replace your tenure? Who knows? Okay. <laughs> you know, you got to sit and wait on it. So I don't know. You know, those are talks that happen all the time. Um, the distillery here was Castle and Key. Um, my boss, is, we, you know, at first it's like, you know, do we let people know? Do you know we we're going to talk about it? And then we had nine women from um, Kentucky on a tour in Widow Jane, and they're like, oh, we decided to come here because we saw all your barrels at Castle and Key. <laughs> Yeah, I have to. I have to. I have to tell you. I I was at Castle and Key and walking between the buildings on a tour, and I'm watching the Widow, Widow Jane, Jane. <laughs> Widow Jane barrels roll across the road there. Yeah, there's no secrets in this business. And I'm going to put one note in too about the barrels. The barrels come from Zach Cooperage in Athertonville, Kentucky. In fact, you know what? I, when I, on my way over here today, I thought, you know what? We should have made this a driving tour. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> because there's so many places. So up in Athertonville, Zach Cooperage. Um, it was started. Um. By Bert Zimlick. He had been running the Brown Farm in Cooperage and started this Cooperage. And then they were raising barrels for one of the larger distilleries. I won't name it, but the contract got cut. I was the first large order after all of that had happened. And um, 
they, you know, we have, we have our own widow Jane finish from there. Um, running the plant now, um, are Bruce and Zach Simlick, the son and the grandson now. Um, and that it's a remarkable place to visit. It's an old defunct, they don't have any tours per se, right? It, it was an old Seagram's plant that was abandoned and the history there is so old and I'm going to get this wrong. I'm not going to try to go too far into this, but when I was working for Steve Beam, we, um, he had uncovered the fact that, uh, Abraham Lincoln's father had worked at that distillery for one of, um, Steve's ancestors. Wow. Yeah, because it's just down the road from, you know, Lincoln's boyhood home because it's between Hodgenville and Athertonville. And so there's so much history there and you feel it when you get on site there. But then, you know, it was a Seagram's plant that went out of business and they took it over for the cooperage years ago. And, um, you know. So, Lisa, we were talking earlier about your your past and, and <laughs> how you got from a winery to, to Kentucky and you're here, you're learning to drink whiskey. And how did you get, take me from that point to on to to widow Jane, I guess. Oh yeah. Um, as I said earlier that, um, the, the winery that I built, um, the couple went through a divorce and I saw that was happening. And so I had booked a ticket to Northern Sonoma. I'm like, uh Oh, this is Kentucky. And I thought, well, I'm going to have to, because of the timetable with grape harvest and everything, it's like, I've got to work quickly. It was in the spring, late spring. And so I booked this ticket. I think I'm going to have to go out there to this. Actually, it was to a rosé festival, but it was up in Northern Sonoma where it's really rustic and, and rural. And I thought, I'm just going to have to go from winery to winery and see if I can work harvest there somewhere and then regroup and come back to Kentucky and try to start over in Kentucky again. Right. And, um, so the, because I'd already been working in the evenings with Steve Beam, uh, the day after I resigned the winery, um, Paul and Steve Beam took me to dinner and hired me full time wow, and brought me on. Dinner. So I got in, yes, I got into distilling cause I, you know, I, I know, knew both of them. And like I said, I'd been in the distillery frequently. Um, and so I got into distilling a lot faster and I didn't look back. I mean, it, it as much as I love, I thought winemaking was the best job in the whole world until I started distilling and I was mistaken. Distilling is the best job in the whole world. <laughs> wow. So you, you get into distilling and that's it. Limestone. Yes. We did a lot of client work. We actually had a client overlap because I had already started making some brandy bases. I'd been making some uh, fruit wines as brandy bases that we were transferring to the distillery to distill. And so that project was already on deck. And that's the reason they brought me in for that project. It was for, um, it was actually tied to one of the television shows. Um, and, um, we were, Steve was doing a lot of client work in addition to laying his own stuff down. And so the client work took up so much of our time. Um, and that's what I ended up falling into mostly was, um, research and development on client, client projects. And, um, Steve was great in the fact that he just, you know, he trusted me and, um, would let me just run with it, you know? And so we were able to put some things in production and, and, you know, kind of improve what we thought originally we was going to getting proposed to us. And so we were doing that, um, obviously laying down as much of our own product as we could during that time. So it was chaotic and crazy and 65 to 80 hour weeks. I like to tell a story on Steve. The last time, the latest I've ever turned down a turn off is still was two forty five in the morning, and I'd gotten my plastic Adirondack chair from outside, and I had I had my blanket and my pillow for my truck, and and um, setting my you know I'm sitting there um, with my alarm on every fifteen minutes to wake you know wake back up and make sure I didn't fall asleep right, and um, so I get a text from Steve and he's like, "Are you okay? There was a flash in the sky." I'm like, "If, if there was a flash in the sky, I'm certainly <laughs> you'll be answering that phone right." <laughs> your text message, but yes, I'm like, no, I've not blown up your distillery. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so there was just crazy times during that time. Um, um, and, uh, you know, we had, we accomplished a lot. Um, you know, um, it was, it was, like I said, just crazy times, but, um, Luxco purchased them and I was fired in that purchase. I was, you know, um, and a, in quite fairly, you know, it, it's one of those things like, you know, it, it's, it's the, proverbial best thing that ever happened. It didn't seem like it at the time. I thought, oh my gosh, am I going to have to go back to winemaking? Not that that was, you know, the worst, worst case scenario, but at the same time, I'm like, I love distilling so much and I just gotten enough of it under my belt to know that's what, exactly what I should be doing. And, um, they, um, but you know, if I purchased 50% of a business, I wouldn't want, you know, two, two people from the other company, you know, at the top they sure. are. So, um, so th that worked out okay. And, um, I, 
immediately had immediately had an offer because this is like when craft distilling is exploding, right? When I started distilling with Steve, there were 250 craft distilleries, just 10 times that now. There's 2,500 2, craft distilleries now. So I immediately had, uh, Dave Sherrick had been working with a project in um, South Carolina. Um, so they interviewed me immediately, offered me a full-time job. I wasn't willing to move to South Carolina only because there was too much for me to learn here in Kentucky. I was like, I'm not ready for that yet. And so they countered with consulting. So I could consulted for them in Palme um, Palmetto um, Distillery or Palmetto. Yeah. Palmetto Distillery down in, in, uh, in South Carolina. And they, um, Palmetto Moonshine. Those guys are awesome. They're just a tremendous oh, group I've of people. Some down of that juice before. They are so, oh, those two are so much fun. There's a, I'm going to jump forward to when I was distilling at Starlight. One day that one of the women runs up the hill. She goes, there are two guys here in a Cadillac with horns on it and they're way too young, too young to be driving it. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh my gosh. Trey and Brian are here. That's awesome. Um, the um, So anyway, so I, I did that. But then Ted Huber found out that I was on the market and Ted as Huber Orchard and Winery. They've been yeah. making wine forever. And so we'd known each other for my winemaking years. So so um, he'd added a grain distillery. I did not know that he had done that. And so he and Dana had another offer from a very well-known, very well-known distillery. And um, it was on the table. I was getting ready to accept it. And Ted said, please don't do that until I talk to you. Well, there's a snowstorm and it's like on a Thursday, I'm supposed to talk to Ted and I'm going to accept this offer on a Friday. And he's like, can you just extend it a little bit? I said, yes. And so I thought, okay. And I was, you know, pretty, pretty sure. I mean, you know, 95% sure I was going to accept this other offer. And I thought, well, as a professional courtesy, I'll talk to Ted and Dana. And, and I went and he knocked everything out of the park, not just monetarily, but with what was going to happen and what I was going to be able to do there and what the distillery, how the distillery was laid out. And I thought this is more traditional distillery. And this is what I really want to do. I thought I'd be there forever. They're tremendous people and it's a tremendous project. It, it's nice to be wanted, right? It's nice. To, yeah. You know, <laughs> it, it, as, as long as, you know, as long as you like, you know, what am I trying to say? Just, just work hard and stay in the right place. The, the industry has grown so dramatically, you know, you, there's, there's just lots of demand right now. Well, it makes it sound, you sound, sound like you show up early. And you leave late. I so do. that in this, I guess this newer generation that's lacking, right? You know, and people want that. They want somebody that's going to be dedicated and loyal to their brand. Yes. And I don't, you know, it's hard for me to say that because I don't see that lacking. I have, you know, three grown children that work themselves crazy and they're successful, but part of it is because they go to work early and they stay late. That's probably <laughs> part of your, your, um, doing. it's certainly, it's certainly, um, not me necessarily, but as a family trait, you got, you know, that yeah. I inherited from my parents and certainly I see it in, you know, in, in my, and my sisters and their children. And, you know, we, we were, that's the way we were raised. And um, well, let's talk about that. You're mm -hmm. raising and stuff. When's your, your first sip of bourbon or whiskey? Oh my gosh. It had to be Jack Daniels in college and Jack Daniels way in too college. much. Of it. <laughs> You know, some people would say that's not, that's not, that's not bourbon. That's just whiskey. But. Yeah, I know. I know. You're right. And exactly. And so whiskey, um, I, then I, you know, I had, um, had my kids and we we're moving a lot. And quite frankly, I had some health issues and I didn't drink a lot. And, um, as I was able to get all those, you know, taken care of and the kids got a little bit older and, um, certainly when I started making wine, you know, and the, winemaker that trained me was a bourbon guy. Right. Sure. And so, and then my daughter had, um, met her future husband at the time and he was a Kentucky boy. And so his family, his father as well, educated me tremendously and he still does. Um, he's awesome. He sends me all these obscure bourbon articles that are really tremendous articles that I would miss. Right. You know, sure. so Pat's always sending me these amazing things. And, um, so, you know, it's, it's actually, you know, been relatively recently, you know, in the last two decades that, um, you know, whiskey's become, you know, first, first for recreational reasons. And then I've also discovered early on that when I was making wine, the winemaker that trained me gave me the best advice I've ever had. It's like, don't just drink your own juice. You're going to start to like it. And so part of his thing about drinking whiskey was it wasn't wine. So if you're blending wine all day, it was a chance for your brain to shift gears sure. and not just get house palate. So besides widow Jane, <laughs> you know, if you're sitting at home at night and you say, mm -hmm. I want a, a bourbon, what else do you got on your shelf? Oh my gosh. Um, 
it's on the shelf, it's on the floor, it's on the sideboard, <laughs> it's on the side table, it's in the kitchen, it's in on the um, um, little table when you come into the entryway. There are several bottles in my bedroom. <laughs> so what, what else do you have? Like, what else are you drinking? Oh my gosh. It, it You know, I go on different tears sometimes for different distilleries. So like I'll get on one of the major distilleries and then like for like three weeks or so, just keep tasting all the stuff that they they put out, you know, but part of it is just, you know, if, if it's recreational, it's one thing I'll I'll drink whatever anybody's pouring for me, you know, and enjoy it. Hey, free bourbon's the best. Yeah, free bourbon's the best for it, right? <laughs> and um, but as far as you know, trying to develop my palate because I'm still on the edge of all of that, you know, even though I'm doing this, you know, and it's the same thing, trying not to keep house palate. So I'll go through it, you know, I'll go through a heaven hell tear and then I'll go through a, a wild turkey tear and then I'll go through, you know, think that you know, my makers makers is always on the shelf because of the family connection there, but um it, um, four roses has always been a staple, you know, I mean, I, I, uh, uh, you know, like the four roses, single barrel is always a fallback Tuesday night for me. You know, I always know it's going to be dependable. It's always going to be a little bit different. Um, oh my gosh, I, we should walk over to my house oh. <laughs> so, when the weather's warm. You have an invitation to come back and we'll sit in my, sit in the rocking chairs on my front porch and you guys can dig through my piles of piles of whiskey. Yeah. I would love for you. I would love for you to do that. So there's been a, several people on my front porch and, you know, like, you know, everything from the farmer to the Coopers and to, you know, all, of, um, you know, so, certainly something well, that's fun in Barnstown. You know, they all, they all make great juice and mm -hmm. uh, it's great to sit around and appreciate all of it. Right. Yes. Yes. Uh, and it, it, it's good. Mm -hmm. I mean, I agree. Mm -hmm. I've heard, I've heard from many distillers about house palette and how it can really get you a uh, tunnel vision. Yes, it can. It can. And, 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 you know, so I'm really aware of that. Well, I'd say you, I'd ask you what you thought about the bourbon culture, but I, I, I can see that you're well ingrained and, and deep entrenched inside the bourbon culture and, and believe in uh, what it brings to America. Um, and I'd say you got a very extensive bourbon road. Well, Jim, let's take a, a quick break, you think, and then we'll get into the, the vaults um, in your limited releases, and we'll go ahead and drink this second pour. What do you say? Right. Sounds good. We would like to thank Tommy and Gwen Mitchell from Logheads Home Center for supporting this episode of The Bourbon Road. Logheads Home Center, nestled in the hills of Kentucky, is an industry leader in building handcrafted rustic furniture. Family owned and operated, they take pride in offering only the very best for their customers. The log heads, and that's what they like to call themselves, are skilled wood crafters who are passionate about creating rustic furniture for people who appreciate the beauty of natural wood. Owners Tommy and Gwen don't just sell the rustic lifestyle, they live it. And you can be sure that Logheads Furniture will always be handcrafted in Kentucky by artisans who embrace the simple way of life. Logheads Rustic Furniture is made from northern white cedar, a sustainable wood that's naturally rot and termite resistant. Its beauty and quality will add warmth to your earthy lifestyle for generations to come. Be sure to check out everything they have to offer at LogheadsHomeCenter.com. And while you're at it, give Tommy and Gwen a shout on Facebook or Instagram at Logheads Home Center. back and Lisa what do you have for us for the second pour um, our recently released vaults um, it is 14 and 15 year old juice of course it says reflected with a 14 year old um, it is um, Indiana and Tennessee and it is a project that I've been working on for several months trying to decide what we're going to do and and you know maybe possibly the first in a series but um, um yeah, it's been a labor of love for sure. Um, it's the oldest juice I've ever had the privilege of working with. Um, that, that part was a little bit nerve wracking, but, um, I think we came up with a pretty decent, decent, um, balanced blend. There's certainly a story behind it, but I'd like everybody to taste it first before I go into what the background is in it, because there's a little bit, you know, of a down the road secret here that I'm going to reveal, but, um, uh -oh, breaking um, news on the bourbon <laughs> may actually say, may actually say it on the back label. Okay. But. <laughs> We so can pretend not, we can, make, like we can add a little intrigue, right? So yeah. Well let's 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 yeah. taste this. Yeah, right. cheers guys. Cheers. cheers. Wow, that's pretty amazing. 
I thought it was going to have a lot more uh, bite on the back end. But you're 99 proof. Wow. I like that. Yeah, that is uh, 99 proof. So you're proofing this down to just just under 100. Mm -hmm. Uh, What kind of proof are you dealing with on the original barrels? Oh, my gosh. They've been varying dramatically. Okay. Um, They've come in as low as, oh, gosh, you know, uh, under 110 to as high as 123. Nine one thirty four. Wow. Yeah, you know, so it's been all over the map. It's really interesting. So was that that you said that before that this this blend was twenty total barrels, right? Correct. And uh, I said twenty, and I'm scratching my head, going, "I'm the person that did this." And was it twenty or twenty <laughs> one? I can't remember. Yeah, I think it's twenty. And how long does a process like that take? This one took a a, a lot longer than it should have um, because I mean, you, you know, you're in, in a new environment. Um, I have to because of the the situation with the the. Um, the layout of the current building that we're in, I have to blend at my desk, which is bled over into another desk, which, you know, is my, my, um, staff is really patient. Cause I've got whiskey bottles everywhere. Um, we had to, I actually, um, you know, you have to pull the barrels in, you know, you have to start sampling barrels across. Um, even, you know, you request samples from the, the original places where things are stored. Um, because you start, you have to keep tasting and tasting. So you start, start to develop what the profile is going to be coming out of those barrels. Otherwise you get a sample from maybe one, three barrels and you're like, okay, well this one tastes like this, this one tastes like this. But if I'm getting a lot of, you know, 10 of these barrels or 14 of these barrels in or 30 of these barrels in, you know, you want to taste across as many of them as you can. So you start to have in your head what um, the basic flavor profile is on them. The actual process of blending, you know, I, I'm at a point where, you know, I do 200 milliliter samples. And so, you know, you're, but you're even shifting things just maybe two milliliters at a time, three milliliters at a time. And then you keep trying to reproduce that. My bosses have gotten used to me like reproducing things kind of on site. I mean, they do better after they've had a chance to um, sit for a few days and, and the blend come together, but they also have been used to me just pulling things and blending it because I want to be sure that I can recreate it. You know, it's so easy to make a really one bottle of something absolutely beautiful to be able to extend that, especially in a craft distillery setting, because, you know, we don't have a formal lab. We don't have, we have a little bit of a lab that we use for testing, you know, um, our mash and, and doing our proofing and things on spirits, but we don't have uh, the space for, you know, a formal blending lab. Right. So I just want to be able to be sure that I can always like keep pulling it out and pulling it out and pulling it out. So literally when we got towards the end of this project and it was getting ready to go in the bottle, um, we split it up into three different, um, tanks, stainless steel tanks. And I quite literally, because each tank varied just a little bit, I, it, I just couldn't let it go to bottle, like, like by bottling the first, even though it was the same blend. Right. But I couldn't let it go to bottle like by bottle, bottling one tank and then the next tank and then the next tank. I literally was in there pulling two barrels out at a time and making five, 55 gallon blends to send to the bottling team. So we did this. It was a labor of love and pretty laborious. And, um, um, you know, the whole team participated in pulling this project off. Um, we are not heated or cooled at Red Hook. So, you know, it's, it's that the environment can be a challenge and we had a little bit of a heat spike during this project and, um, the, the team hang hung in there with me. And when the temperature broke and it was time to go to bottle, they were very generous and did a double shift on bottling one day and a single shift on the other to get you get everything into the bottle, um, and keep the quality on it that we wanted. So well, I'll tell you this, this, uh, this has, a. Uh, to me is like vanilla caramel, maybe uh, some, you got some fruit in there. Yes. So I'm, you know me, I'm always coming out with these crazy, picking out these crazy notes only because I get a flash or an image in my mind when I, when I nose it, usually, usually when I nose it, I get this image and then I taste it. If it's confirmed, I get like a little bit of, I don't know, like minty root beer. Yes, that's it. <laughs> No, really? Yes, You're yes, kidding me. No. I, I <laughs> My I, tasting notes say wintergreen. Um, I did not put root beer down. I put sassafras. I grew up with Southern Indiana sassafras is a thing. Sassafras tea, sassafras bark. And sassafras is one of the barks they use in root beer. Doesn't that have arsenic in it? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yes. grew up, I grew up drinking that same <laughs> sassafras yes. tea as a kid. Yes, my grandmother we would, used to brew it. We would chop that root and yeah. soak sassafras 
that root in there. You know, you peel the root back and then you soak it and get that. And yes. then add that sugar and you get you some good. Yes. That cheap root beer, I guess, right? Yeah. No, I mean, they're not the dominant notes. Right. Obviously, Mike, yeah. you call out the dominant notes, right. I believe. But I was just picking that up, and I got that image in my mind. I got this A and W root beer kind of. Yes. And uh, it's confirmed on the palate, but it's a little more buttery and savory. I think. You may tell you what I really get. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I get, a, yeah, I I get a caramel candied apple. Yeah, with a little bit of hot fudge in there. That's what I really do. Get. I hear cocoa a lot, cocoa yeah. powder. I hear that a lot. I don't know that f- hot yes. fudge. I think you pour on a like a ice cream sundae. I don't I'll know. I'll take it. <laughs> but then, then Jen yeah. says root beer, and I'm like, well, maybe. Yeah, no. no and the, the wintergreen note too. There's <laughs> something in not all, all old whiskeys, but when you, when you have the privilege to taste something that's you know really really old, some of them come up with that menthol quality, and mm-hmm. I have been on a tear trying to figure out where does that menthol come from? Is it because is there something that develops in it after? Cause it's just been sitting in the bottle for three decades or five decades or whatever. Um, was it something in the wood? I mean, it's obvious, you know, when you look at a uh, cross section of Oak these days, it's not the same cross section of Oak that the old whiskey was barreled in because the rings are a lot looser than they used to be. And, so it's like, does that, is that where that comes from? Is there something different with the grain, the yeast? Um, but this time, this I didn't hit the menthol, but I hit this wintergreen note. And I, I stuck with that one because I was like, oh my gosh, I had some that did not have it. Um, and root beer and wintergreen, wintergreen don't sound like they, the, you know, it's like, that's kind right, of conflicting. Um, but no. Our friends the, at the Bourbon Lens would, they'd laugh at this, but <laughs> whorehound. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, actually. Because that's a mint. Absolutely. Candy, it, it's right? an herbal candy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My grandfather used to keep those in a jar on a We keg. have these young guys. All They have a, uh, another podcast with some friends of ours and uh, called the Bourbon oh. Lands. And one of them, we said whorehound. And they're like, what's that? We've never seen that. Uh, what What is a whorehound? And we we're trying to explain it to him. Yeah, it's an herb that it. they make into herbal candy. Well, I mean, if, you, if you shop for half of what you own at Tractor Supply. <laughs> <laughs> Royal King and Tractor Royal Supply. King. There's our, there's our, our shout out to Royal you. I love the Royal King candy <laughs> selection yeah. at the checkout. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I have to say, though, um, there's something that happens in my palate whenever I have a, a bourbon that kind of, it kind of rounds the sides of my tongue and I get that little bit of a savory, buttery note and it kind of turns on my saliva falls you know okay. and my mouth just waters i don't drool mike like you said <laughs> but <laughs> that's a it's a it's a it's an imagery thing i tried that's to write bandanas are for, right? <laughs> <laughs> well i said you know you i can taste i can feel my mouth watering right but i can't look at another person and say uh, that person's mouth is watering but i can see jim over there looking at a bourbon okay. and just drool coming out and somebody <laughs> explains it like a dog. I didn't like that imagery, so I cut it, I cut it out of the blog. So. <laughs> yeah, so this is a this is a powerful flavor. It's, it's interesting co- too because it'll continue, even though we've had it poured for a little bit, it'll continue to open up. I'll you know I, I will pour some. I'm working on a project, and um, we're on our 175th batch of small batch, and so I don't get to the luxury of. D- doing this all the time anymore. But when I get to the final blend, I'll pour glasses and put a uh, watch glass on the top of it to, you know, to seal it off and then kind of revisit those during the day and even into the next day sometimes. Um, and this one will continue to open up and evolve. It's been really interesting. Um, you know, what flavors come forward and then they fall off and then something else comes forward. But, you know, we've got a lot of broken, broken in leather kind of things sometimes, especially if it's had an opportunity to sit for a little yeah, bit. Yeah, no, I'm getting the leather and the tobacco. One of the things I noticed between the, the mm-hmm. 10 year old and this one is a similarity that they both have the kind of this mineral. This, is it coming from the water? It's coming from the water. Okay. So, yeah, they both have this kind of minerally note to it. Right. And it's a, it's a good, it's almost like a Burton salt kind of thing. Yes. I don't know. It's. So my secret that's on the label here is Zach Cooperage that I spoke about earlier down the road here in Athertonville. They we were having a conversation and they they said offhandedly we have some um, wood that's eight year old air seasoned wood. I'm like, excuse me. <laughs> eight year that's a long time, eight right? Eight years a long time. Yeah, two and four years. You know, it's like even a luxury. And I like, oh my gosh! I said, please raise. I said, we, we have this, we, we have this little thing that we can call hamburgers. So if there's a stave that they tell me about or something, I have them cut them into blocks and then ch- to- toast them or char them or whatever. And sometimes I have the boxes on my front porch here or whatever, but, um, and so that I can, I can use those and, and kind of do some preliminary testing on what kind of flavors that the whiskey is going to draw out of those pretty relatively quickly. And, and, um, so they had done that and they done it with, with the eight year old. It's like, oh my gosh, within a day or two, it's like, holy cow. Cause there's 
no tannin left and it's a different, it's a, it's, it's it's certainly Oak. It's certainly the air season Oak that we're used to those flavors and, and whiskey, but, um, there's just no, no grape stem green tannins left in it at all. Um, it's campfire. The wood was so brittle. Um, I'm all about 53 gallons. I'm I'm not, people that know me know I'm not a small, small barrel person. And, um, but they couldn't, it was too brittle to raise 53s. And since we were just finishing in those, they were able to raise thirties. And so we brought those to New York. Oh, and eight years. Are we talking about a gray Oak, sort of a gray barrel? Oh, it's, it's gray. Oh, it's very gray. Almost yeah. looks like, it's looking like a piece of old barn wood. It looks like a piece of old barn wood. Mm, and it's just amazing. so be- beautiful. I mean, and after they had, um, you know, finish them on the inside. You take that bung out. It is just spectacular. Now, I'm it's sure like the in best those piece of firewood smell that you've ever smelled in your entire life. Yeah, it's awesome. And so we have part, not all of it, but we put barreled part of it partially in those barrels to bring some of those notes out in the 14. And do you have a lot of loss in those barrels since that's been aged? No, a we did because since they're new barrels, they're okay. new, you know, and they're, they're, they are an excellent cooperage and the cooperage the cooperage is tight and yeah, we don't have any loss. I mean, we have some, it certainly absorbs some of the whiskey, but, um, sure. and we don't have any loss, you know, through the barrel itself. Now, what else do you have coming up? Like limited releases? Are you going to have a weeded bourbon? Um, it's not in the plans right now. I have been running all kinds of different ryes though. And I've run some weeded rye and it is amazing. It's absolutely delicious. It's my favorite of all the ryes that we've run so well. I do like 95% malted rye. So we've, uh, last year because of inheriting the project and getting everything back up and running in, um, New York and, and, and producing a lot more whiskey than they had been. Um, we ran out of the corn last year until we had, you know, until we had the new crop. And so we ran quite a bit of rye during that during that um, time and did all kinds of experimental rye bells. Do you talk about doing any like single malts or anything like that? Oh, I will. I mean, not as maybe not as like a outside of the distillery kind of release, you know, my bosses may fall over dead hearing me say this, but they know this already. It's like, we will be making some single malt, Um, the American single malt commission. Um, you know, I believe in what they're doing. And, um, some people say that's the next up and coming thing. Is I hear malts. that a lot. I hear that a lot because it's, it's fun to make, it's fun to drink. Right. And, um, there's a lot of room in the market for American malts. And there are some areas of the country that, uh, it's, it's very popular, yes. very popular. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And the, the, the fortunate thing for the whole industry is that the American malt commission, um, you know, the people that are participating in that are following all the quote unquote rules in it. And they're turning out some really high quality malt. And that's, that is, you know, that's obviously the the driver behind all of it. If it all had been all poor, poor, poor examples of malt, you know, nobody would give it the time of day, but fortunately um, the people that have come out of the gate strong with it are making some really fabulous juice. And so what, what do you, where do you see widow Jane in the future? Like, what do you, what do you mm-hmm. foresee as far as like, releases coming out, maybe some older juice or your guys' own juice. What's your, um, what's your like age going to yeah, be? Yeah. Our, you know, our, our goal right now is to repatriate everything to New York. You know, New York has an old distilling tradition. Um, I, you know, spent a little bit of time in the New York historical society, looking up the, the, the distillation history, um, you know, especially in particularly in Brooklyn. And it's, it's amazing how much grain distill it was being made. There's a, still a huge, um, uh, mill there. And that, I mean, an enormous mill it's, it's uh, been abandoned, but it was only feeding the brewing and distilling industry at one point. And it's actually in our sight line from, you know, from, um, down the street from where we are, but, um, so much rum was being made there, right. You know, it's a port and molasses was coming in. Um, but the, like I said, the distillation, you know, history is really, really rich there. Um, but, that's, that's our ultimate goal is to get everything repatriated. I mean, the corn growing is going to happen there and everybody here is aware that that's going to, you know, going to shift. And then, um, that outside of, you know, of course we'll keep Zach Cooperage, but, um, outside of that, that everything else will be repatriated to New York. There's some New York Cooperages that are doing some amazing, beautifully wonderful barrels, but they're not at the scale that we need right now. So, you know, I, I use those for some specialty pro- projects that I'm working on some R and D stuff, but, um, uh, made with New York Oak, you know, New York Cooper Adirondack wood, and it's absolutely fabulous stuff. And so another Cooperage they're they're only raising small barrels. And I told them, I said, if you start raising some 53s, I'm going to buy your first fit three fifty threes Cause I do want to incorporate some New York Cooperage as well. And I think it's pretty doing. amazing that you're, you're like all over the place and, you say you talk about George Washington's distillery and stuff, and you know we 
last couple of weeks we've talked about whiskey and history and whiskey in the military and and old George man he he uh that's that's the way they said they survived Valley Forge that winter there in Valley Forge Pennsylvania was whiskey and who knows where that came from did it come from his distillery it came somewhere from the east coast though yeah he wasn't he wasn't distilling at the time steve ashore is the um you know is the is the guy he's the director of trades at um mount vernon and over the the distillation he's the distiller and head distiller and, and master miller and um the, washington didn't start distilling until after the war because he had James Anderson. He had a Scottish foreman that had written him and said, you know, I'd like to be, um, I'm going to get all the terms wrong. The foreman of your, of your farms. And so the, or the, and work in the mill. And so he gets there and he's like, you're milling all this grain already. You might as well be making some, making some whiskey out of it. And so, um, you know, it was just a few years before Washington's death. I hope I don't get all of this incorrect. Um, Washington's death, but the, there was a year that they produced with these five little stills, 11,000 gallons. Isn't that oh. how they got rid of their grain? They had leftover grain that they didn't make bread with, right? Right, so they had right. To well, and that's sort of the history of distilling. Yeah, I mean, you look yeah. at Maker's Mark and, you know, that was Burke Springs Mill, right? Because there was a grist mill there first. Yeah. first and that's, you know, there there um some some people that I've spoken to and Steve's one of them that, you know, they believe that maybe Miller's wives were the first people that were writing down mash bills because they would get a regular amounts of grain and in order to keep, the, you know, cause, um, distilling was hearth work. It was women's work, you know, so you're cooking and you're going to be cooking the mash and you're going to be distilling as well because it was just Becky, Becky Harris from Catoctin Creek said something amazing a couple of weeks ago. She goes, you know, if, if laundry was artisanal, men, men may be doing the laundry too, right? Oh, man. <laughs> that's, yeah. my, that's what and I did so yesterday. I told laundry. Becky, I said, oh my gosh. I said, I think you just brought the house out of all the things, 11 distillers on this panel. And I think you, I think you just nailed it. But, but, uh, you know, I think traditionally, like I said, distill, distillation was, was women's work because you had fruit that was going bad. You'd ferment it and distill it. If you had grain, that's the only way you could keep it. You also were producing your own cash for barter. You know, so you, you know, you had a little bit of, you know, money to burn as well, but, but also as a way to keep, make medicine, um, keep your grain from going bad, you know, um, so your, you know, whiskey was currency, right? I mean, whiskey was currency, yeah. you know, we have evidence of that here in Bardstown, you know, it's, um, you know, when there was, the, when, you know, people were out and expanding the country and there wasn't paper currency to be had, you know, you, you, you could make whiskey and you had currency. Right. Well, they trade trade whiskey sometimes to frontiersmen for for their pelts. You know, companies uh, like uh, the Hudson Bay Company of New York, right. they would trade that their right. whiskey for you know pelts to the frontiersmen, and they would go off and drink right. a little whiskey. Right, and if you didn't drink it, you had it to trade off again, right? Yeah. To oh, yeah. you know, for something else that you needed. So yeah. yeah, it's it's pretty phenomenal, and and you know, so you start tracing through that, and you realize, but. But like I said, so there's some historians that believe that maybe Miller's wives were the first ones that were writing down some of those recipes. I think D.W. Samuels here in, in right here in this Barstown area, that's how he he had he was a Miller to start out with, and then he was like, "Well, I'm, I got all this leftover grain. Right. I need to get rid of it before it spoils." And um, yeah, because people paid the Miller in grain. Yeah, you know they would they would pay them in in more grain, and yeah, you know you got it up to your eyeballs. Might, might as well make some whiskey. <laughs> well, that's not a bad way to. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Hey, I'm, thank, thank, a little bit of bread, a little bit of whiskey, you're thank good to you go. Thank you, T.W. Samuels, for <laughs> yeah. coming out with some, some good stuff. Yeah, yeah. No, so it's so fascinating. There's too much to know. That's the reason I, I trip up and hesitate about saying like factual stuff about it because there's so much out there. You know, it's interesting. Pro, you know, in some places we're still suffering from prohibition, right? I mean, that interruption of what was handed down and what was happening at the time, you know, we're still trying to, and the fact that the craft is still movement has just taken off in the last 10 years there's just so much more interest and so there's still i think the thing that surprises me the most and there's still many so many stones to be turned over you know with the history of distillation in the well, united I, states I, I tell you what if you slipped up on here one of our listeners will oh awesome i, 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 I look forward to it i like i like the conversation they like, they like to call us out quite often and say hey i think you guys yeah. Yeah, slipped, we, slipped up here we, we don't get away with anything <laughs> And you know, our, that's you know, good. That's good. That means that people are actually listening. I'm going to fix it all here in a couple of weeks when we have Michael Veach on now. Oh, yeah. Michael <laughs> fixes everything. Gonna, yeah. Nobody's going to call him. I don't, I don't yeah. think. Um, and he knows what he's talking about. Yeah. We're just two guys drinking bourbon, two veterans, right. you know, 
right. and just have fun and Sometimes, you know, it looks up, up and right. we, we could be wrong. You know? Right. As I said in one of our pre-conversation, Mike, Michael is certainly one of my heroes and I um, will be forever indebted to him for everything that he's done to help me with my career. And It's kind of amazing. We're sitting here in this room, yeah. right? And, and looking around and I see, you know, up, up there's probably a little bit of controversy in here because right up top here, it says Elijah Craig, the father of bourbon. And people yeah. probably would think, oh, well, that's not true. <laughs> um, well, but that folklore is part of it, though. You know, I, that's the other thing, too, is, that, you know, for a while I, I I call them, quote unquote, the truth seekers. There are people, too, that will that want to pick apart some of the stories to the point. Now, if you're openly fraudulent, that doesn't count. But sure. But but it's part of the folklore of this business, you know, and I think it's colorful and I think it's beautiful. And if people are not hanging their hat on it going, you know, absolutely, this is the way it was. It's like the folklore of Widow Jane. Right. And we were discussing that earlier. And if you go up there and talk to five different people in the Rosendale area, they're going to give you the same story, but it's going to be a different version, you know? And I think that folklore is, is, uh, makes, makes it all richer. That's, that's part of American spirit, right? Yeah, that's absolutely. Right. That's, that's it. Folklore yeah. and stuff. Yeah. And, Elijah you know? Craig, you know, that's a perfect example of a folklore, right? I mean, it's beautiful and, and there's, and how does folklore happen? There's truth in it, right? But there's also just the human, human condition of, um, translating the story over and over again. Right. Yeah. Right. So, you know, our listeners are across the country. Yeah. What states are you in? I mean, is it is it nationwide? Is it mostly um, focused in the east? 30, last count, 37 states. Okay. Um, we're certainly on the West Coast. Um, um, we are, you know, off the top of my head, can I tell you those? That's the lovely thing about what I do. I get to do, and I think our sales team and our advocacy mm-hmm. team all the time is like, if you guys don't do what you do, I don't get to do what I do. And thank God you're so good at what you do. And so 37 states total? 37 states. We're in Australia, Canada, and I believe in several European states. I won't put a number on that, but um, or the countries, those aren't states. Okay, maybe a little bit of a run. Our, our <laughs> listeners in Australia, Jacob, Jacob yeah. Bell, he he could pick him up a bottle of this book. Widow Jane. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, 37 states, that's roughly three quarters. I mean, I'm not going to mm-hmm. do the math here, but right. about three. So about three quarters of the nation can reach out on the shelf and grab your stuff. Yes. And, you know, of course, we would like to think that we're going to be everywhere as soon as we can possibly can. But uh, we grew 42 percent last year. Yeah. And um, my staff, you know, the team at Widow Jane is killing it. Yeah. Um, what about uh, military exchanges? They're uh, classic stores and they're liquor stores. I don't know the answer to that. All I'm right. sorry. I don't. Yeah. Well, okay. So some listener out there going to your PX looking for some yeah, Widow let them, Jane. Let us yes, know. Yes. Yes. It's Lisa at WidowJane.com. They can send me a note and tell me they found it. I'd be happy to hear from them. And where can our listeners find you on social media? Um, well, oddly enough, I don't use Twitter very often, but because I was a winemaker before I was a distiller, it said always about wine. <laughs> And, um, um, I keep telling myself I'm going to get more active with Twitter again. I used to be on, um, Instagram is LB Wicker, uh, on Instagram, um, on Facebook, it's Lisa Roper Wicker. Roper is my maiden name. And, the uh, the company website, Widow Jane. Widow Jane. Yeah. Widowjane.com. Widowjane.com. That makes it easy. Yes. Yes. And info at Widow Jane. Dot com is if anybody's got any questions, we, um, Diana on our staff, you know, Diana and Jillian and Michelle, I'll look, look those all over and, um, you know, and kind of, um, you know, uh, get the right person to answer the right questions on those, but they're always really good about looking at that every single day. So, so it's been a, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show today. You know, it was even better. You sharing your whiskey with us. <laughs> those are two fine yeah. bottles, let yes. me tell you. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm so much fun to have somebody to sit down and drink some whiskey with in the Oscar Getz Museum in the middle yeah. of the day, for heaven's sake. This is this is incredible. Well, Lisa, thank you so much for uh, bringing your whiskey to us Absolutely. and uh, sharing it with us and making automatic friends. That's what I think that's what whiskey's all about in the whiskey culture. Yeah, if you, gotta, you just have to promise you're going to tag along on, on a little bit of a, a, a mini tour and sit on my front porch and Let's drink some whiskey. It. We, we will remember that, weather arms that, up. That, we absolutely will. I'd love to <laughs> yeah. sit on your front porch and drink some whiskey. That's great. <laughs> We do appreciate all of our listeners, and we'd like to thank you for taking time out of your day to hang out with us here on the Bourbon Road. We hope you enjoyed today's show, and if so, we would appreciate if you'd subscribe and rate us a five-star with a review on iTunes. Make sure you follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at The Bourbon Road. That way you'll be kept in the loop on all the Bourbon Road happenings. 
You can also visit our website at thebourbonroad.com to read our blog, listen to the show, or reach out to us directly. We always welcome comments or suggestions. And if you have an idea for a particular guest or topic, be sure to let us know. And again, thanks for hanging out with us. Thank you.